Hello and welcome back to Sid Meier's Civilization 6. Mm, if you're one of the few elite people who have seen one of my other videos that were from a few months ago, uh, just so you know, I, I, I disappeared because I became obsessed with a game called Dota. But anyway, I'm back home in Civ and I'm ready to check out the new DLC that came out. Uh, two new Civs, Alexander, of, finally of Macedonia not Greece, and Cyrus of Persia. I'm going to be doing Cyrus. Mm. Uh, I think he's a very, very strong Civ. I'll talk about that. Yeah, going to be playing as Yidi, of course. Standard size. Probably Pangaea. Kind of, kind of feeling it. And just kind of... It's a little better if you're roaming around conquering stuff with land units like we're going to be doing. So yeah, I'm just going to jump right into it. I'll talk about, like, the Civ and, and the Immortal Rush and things like that. From the first stirrings of life beneath water, to the great beasts of the Stone Age, to man taking his first upright steps, you have come far. Now begins your greatest quest. From this early cradle of civilization, on towards the stars. Claim the crown, Cyrus, King of Persia, for you are the Anointed One. With immortal soldiers and an unwavering faith, you will conquer and rule the peoples of the world. You may see many alliances forming around you, but do not be fooled. Such is an antiquated and weak way of navigating the world. Make no promise unless it aids you in achieving your goals. All right, so Ned Stark says, betray everybody. Got it? Yeah, Cyrus, uh, Persia, very, very, I think very strong. One of the better civs, definitely. Probably even top tier, close to the top tier. Not OP, but very, very good. And that's mainly because of Fall of Babylon and the Immortal. So I'll just talk, like, their, okay, so uh, their leader bonus, uh, Cyrus's leader bonus is Fall of Babylon, uh, plus two movement for the first ten turns after a surprise war. <coughs> Excuse me, this is decent. Plus two movement for de declaring a surprise war. This, uh, this is very, very good. Uh, ten turns might not sound like a lot on the first the first first glance, but in reality, if your units are in position uh, and you declare and then you start attacking, like, it, it's it's quite a long time. Uh, you don't want to be fighting against this. <laughs> if you're like, if they swarm in, you're not gonna you're, and they have ten turns of this of this nonsense at you, um, <laughs> you're gonna be very afraid. Two movement's crazy, so that doubles the movement of all your melee and ranged units. Uh, gets your horsemen up to, you know, six or so. Mm. Even gets your scouts up to seven movement. Uh, you can do funny things like, if you're scouting in the early game, let's say you have like a couple of scouts roaming the map, and you meet a sieve across the world, that's no threat to you. You can just declare a surprise war on them with no warmonger penalty, and all your scouts and all your units will be like supercharged for 10 turns with no real consequences. So that's kind of funny. But uh, yeah, very, very powerful ability, really awesome. Uh, the other aspects are much smaller. Oh, I actually didn't, I didn't notice before the no no penalties to occupied cities. That's very, very cool. Um, that's definitely really helpful in multiplayer. Single player, like virtually always, they'll They'll let you see. They'll seed the city to you when you make peace. So it doesn't really matter too much. But until you make peace, it can't help. And then there are other there's certain late game scenarios where for some reason they don't ever seed cities to you. It's really weird. I don't know. Anyway, the other parts right. So uh, warmongering warmongering is nice. Uh, war weariness. No, it's not too big a deal. War weariness um, is very, very minor. 
if you didn't know, it's important to know uh, a tip here. War weariness, it doesn't matter how long you've been at war. It only goes up based on interactions, like actions. So if you, so declaring a war, capturing a city, or losing a city, and then, I'm not sure if it's combat or if it's killing a unit, or if it's a unit dies. I know that you get more war weariness if you're losing a war, like losing units. And I think it might have to do with like whether it's in your territory or not. It, I, I would have to, I have to reread that. But uh, the the important tip to keep to keep in mind is you can stay at war as long as you want with no war weariness penalties, except uh, unless you have actual combat. So it doesn't matter if you stay at war. Um, it just matters if you're having actual combat for war weariness. And the war weariness will actually decrease still while you're at war. It decreases faster while you're at peace. So if you do have a problem with war weariness, you should make peace. But otherwise, um, it's not really a big deal. It's not, it's not too big a factor in the game. Because when you, when you, on single player at least. Uh, yeah, so, but overall, Fall Babylon very very strong uh, Persia's ability set set trap set trapeze I think how you say it plus two plus one capacity for trade route that's kind of a little bonus it's nice it's good it comes early trade routes are awesome in general uh, buff uh, the bonus to internal trade routes is really awesome because internal trade routes tend to be st much stronger than than foreign trade routes um, at very least until your cities are high population but even then like they, they need extra food right so the food helps it, this, the simple reason is that food and production is better than gold you get like extra gold for foreign but you get uh, your core yields your core yields are food and production from doing internal trade routes so that's really awesome and then now if you're Persia you can get your core yields and this nice bonus of gold and culture so it's 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 nice. It's quite it's good. Very good. You know, political philosophy. You get two trade routes going. That's four gold, two culture, plus you know the food and production yields. It uh, really adds up. And it incentivizes markets as well, or commercial hubs, even more. The uh, roads thing pretty much doesn't matter at all. Uh, I mean, it's nice. Whatever. It's cool. Uh, the Immortal is amazing, in my opinion. The reason being, and I'll talk about this more later. The the reason being, it's you know it's it's six. All right, so it's only thirty melee strength. The swordsman's thirty six. It's quite a downgrade, but it's it's worth it. It's to, it would be too way too OP otherwise. Um, you can so it's it's very weird if you don't know already. It's a melee unit, but it actually shoots like an archer. It's two range, um, but it's still a melee class unit. And it actually only has the strength of an archer. So it's actually, you know, it's classical era, but it only has 25 range strength. And its melee strength is only 30 compared to a swordsman's 36. So you might be thinking like, well, that's kind of weak. I mean, yeah, these numbers aren't too high, right? But that's because it's tactical ability is insane so it uh, ranged attacks I mean ranged units are already just so much better than melee units in this game because of how movement works and the reason being uh, you know a swordsman has more strength right but when it attacks it doesn't just get free damage it, it fights so it takes damage when you shoot a ranged attack you don't take any damage so this is not as much damage, but it's free damage you're inflicting from up to two tiles away. <clears throat> and the thing is, if you have an archer, right, that, that's why archers are so awesome. Or any ranged unit. That's just free damage from far away. But if they get on top of the archer, then it's in trouble. It only has 15 melee strength. The thing about an immortal is it just gets to like blast away at you from far away or from up close without taking any damage. And if you do get on top of it with like a horseman or a melee unit, you're fighting a, a strong melee unit. You're not just rolling over an archer that you got on top of. You're, if you do get on top of the immortal, it's even worse for you because then it has 30 strength. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, I mean, th they just very tanky and you can make a big group of them and they're just very scary to deal with and very, very powerful. They're kind of do-it-all units. They're tanky enough to, they, they're tanky, but they also have a strong, uh, well, not very strong, but they also have a ranged attack. So they just make this, like, scare terrifying death ball, basically. It's very hard to, very hard to deal with. They're very, very good, in my opinion. And other small things are the melee unit promotion tree is better than ranged for the most part. You get like some pretty major like cover bonuses, <coughs> excuse me, bonuses for fighting in districts or like sieging, mm, things like that. And lastly, because it's a melee unit, it benefits from oligarchy. And I think that was factored into when they decided how to balance this. I'm pretty sure they realized this. So uh, oligarchy, it's funny. The thing about oligarchy is like plus four combat strength and melee units is probably the weakest part of oligarchy. But all of a sudden, if you're Persia, <laughs> your like whole immortal immortal army gets plus four combat strength, so it becomes you know four melee strength, twenty nine range strength. Not to mention it has four movement after you've declared war, and uh, melee promotions, and it's it's very very good. You know, we'll, I'll talk about it more. I'll, I'll show it in action coming up. Lastly, is there par par Paradisia? Par Paradise? I can't. I'm not going to try. The <laughs> uh, comes at early empire. <coughs> to sum it up, like, it's, it's eh. Uh, a lot of the unique improvements in Civ 6 are kind of not great. The only reason being they're not core yields. Core yields being... Mm, uh, food and production. So, like, uh, some of the bonus, like, Chateaus, for example. What am I doing? Chateaus give, like, culture, gold, whatever. Like, two gold just kind of sucks. Uh, a really good rule of thumb I use, and I can talk about this, I'll probably talk about this later, though, is, like, three, three gold is equal to one production is a good way to go about it. It might be more like 2.5 gold, but I'm, for the most part, it's three gold. Three gold is as good as one production. So, like, two gold's not even as much as one production. You know, I guess... Uh, but here's the thing. I always... I'm railing on it. But it's actually pretty good. I, I do build these. The reason being, it, it has some decent adjac adjacency bonuses that can really add up. So you can easily get, like, a two, three, two culture, three gold tile on top of, like, the, the, the hill or whatever you put it on. That's actually pretty good. So, you know, uh, it's a nice little bonus. It's it's definitely up to you to, like, observe the terrain, decide, hey, do I actually want to put this there? It's kind of like a luxury tile. So it doesn't add food to production or food. Like, you need the core yields. Food, you need to feed your citizens, grow to your max housing, and then you have to have enough production to, like, do your, do your stuff, make whatever you need. And then if you have extra, like, extra population for floating around, you can stick them on one of these, and you get some really nice bonus yields. Uh, culture, I call like a progression, progression, and then gold is gold is gold. Gold is like its own thing. Like science is a progression yield, um, <coughs> production, and food are like core yields. Gold is kind of a kind of like production, basically, at like a three to one ratio. I, 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 uh, sometimes I'll I go into a speech about that. I'm not going to do that right now, though. <laughs> so this is a pretty cool start. I think I'm going to go right in place. So I'll take a peek over here. I want to have these in range. And there's some desert over there, which I don't want. So I don't see a point. Mm, there might be a reason to go. Actually, no. A one, uh, so uh, overall, plains is, is much stronger than grassland for the most part. Uh, the simple reason being food isn't that important because food is you have housing in this game and Civ 5 mm, that's not what I want doggy in Civ 5 food was the only determinant of how big your city could grow so you just always wanted more food um, Civ 6 it's actually fairly easy to be housing capped. It's actually super, super easy to cap your housing. 
you're going to always be finding yourself wanting more housing and you're never going to be like you're virtually never going to be like oh I don't have enough food a lot of times you're going to wish you had more production too which is why planes is just better because you swap out one of those food for your production and hills are awesome because it's just bonus production I'll leave these on just because I'm uh, I typically play with them off but it can be helpful especially if I'm talking about the terrain or whatever this is what I call a super tile when it's four yield really really awesome to have on turn one immediately working that extra production and, and food is nice all right first meeting city-states very OP so that's two production for non units basically is the word I'm not sure if it applies to projects it doesn't apply to projects either it's fine I think Hong Kong's bonus is projects yeah 20% bonus towards projects it's pretty garbage <coughs> excuse me you don't often want to run projects they don't do that much for you more recently I've been trying to pay closer attention to uh, when like a strong great person comes up and trying to steal him or whatever or her but uh, for the most part not too important hmm, I wonder if Hong Kong will soften this up for us probably worth keeping an eye on getting that free gold and that boost and the uh, it's actually quite important to kill as Persia to kill barbarians early because you want to rush to iron working and you have to go through bronze working which uh, you get from killing barbs <coughs> pardon me Uh, ooh, it's Pangaea, so I'm going to do double scout. Thankfully, we found a new continent. Wonderful. Well, that's okay. Yeah, I don't think Hong Kong is attacking you. It, they're kind of fickle. Like, sometimes they'll... The city-states kind of derp all over the place to whenever they feel like <laughs> with their units. Not really. Sometimes they attack barbs. Usually they don't attack barbs. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, it occurred to me I could have possibly settled on this hill instead. Because it gives you... Uh, Plains Hills give you a bonus production, if you didn't know that. Nothing else you ever settle on, except for, like, a plantation thing. Like, say, if you settle here, you get the plus faith. But otherwise, like, for normal tiles, you get no... They're all, they're all going to end up being 2-1, except for a plain cell, which is 2-2. Two, two. And I talk. I won't talk about that now. I talk about that when I do it, but not right now. Okay, I don't think I want this because I want it to grow. It doesn't make our scout come any faster anyway. It's a bit disappointing that like I don't even know how many iterations. This is what I I have. I didn't play Civ before, like I'm Civ Four. I played a little bit of Civ Four and then a ton of Civ Five, and then a ton of this. But anyway, like, however many iterations... Oh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, however, many, however many iterations... <coughs> of... Uh, this city manager thing they've had, it still isn't very good. <laughs> like, it's still... You still have to pay attention, right? It, you really have to look at your cities to make sure it's doing what you want them to do. Otherwise, it'll do stuff like take 20 turns to grow to pop 3 instead of 10. That's just a no-brainer. So we're going to queue up Astrology. We're going to go halfway and hopefully we find a natural wonder. So that we can boost the way all the way. But the thing is, like, if I don't find a natural wonder, I'm probably just not gonna bother. 
finishing that tech anytime soon. It's kind of like religion, so like sketchy anyway. Like on deity, like what? Well, even if it all goes right, it's like barely worth it. The investment most of the time. It kind of depends, and it, it's it's a weird thing. Like it's definitely not like, oh yeah, like always get a religion. No, like it's it's a huge investment very early in the game. And I think we're gonna do something weird here. Where are this? Hello, Philip. Um, no, we don't want you knowing where I live. Too bad he already does. You don't want to tell them where your city is, like ever. There's no downside, and the to not telling them. And if they do know, there's a chance they'll attack. Although in this case, I didn't see. I already know this, but still, there's no. I mean, there's this thing like there's these diplomatic points for like friendly meeting or whatever, but I'm not 100% sure. Although maybe that is affected by how you act. I I guess it must, right? It doesn't seem to be a big deal though. It is a big deal. Oftentimes they don't find your city otherwise, and you really don't want to be attacked in the early game. So I'm actually doing something weird here. Let me talk about my my build order, like. Pretty much my advice for build order is scout, slinger, settler, and then holy sight if you're going to do religion. That's basically what you want to do um, for deity. And that would apply to lower difficulties as well. <laughs> Look at poor Geneva, lost in the desert. Why is that 1-1? One, one? Oh, it must be a natural wonder. No. We, I, I, I gotta check that out. <laughs> That's so weird. Right, I gotta kill this barb camp now. But like I was saying, no, this is actually really huge advice. Like, uh, scout, slinger, settler. And the, the thing that might seem, you know, scout's obvious because you, you oftentimes you like I did today, uh, two scouts uh, if it's a big map, just because finding city states is huge is uh, first is a huge advantage is best. Man is the no oh no it's elephants why didn't I see that could I see that am I just dumb I don't know uh, finding steady states is huge finding goody huts a lot of goody huts kind of suck but you can find some really good stuff in there and that's a timed thing like you gotta get there before your opponents so you gotta get the, those scouts fast um, the other thing is a scout is like a scout's always a good unit. Like even if you just use it to fight barbs, like it's fairly effective against everything except horsemen. Uh, it's effective against everything except the spawned horsemen. Spawned horsemen, it's very weird. They're stronger than than normal horse. The horse, like I, I can't. Oh god, this is a horseman camp. So the uh, a barb camp spawns horsemen if it's if within a certain range of horses a horse tile I forget how many that is I can't tell you maybe it's three maybe it's six maybe it's four but uh, it's kind of weird so it'll like randomly spawn horsemen that are only 20 strength but if a scout comes back and triggers the the invasion they become like the full strength horsemen 36 <laughs> and that's terrifying but anyway scouts scouts are like you know it's never a bad idea if you're like should I get another scout just do it. It's always a good idea. Even if all they do is get find a little bit of territory and they cost no maintenance, it's just never a bad idea. And just the, the bonuses you can get from fi first finding city states, especially, even more so than. Um, okay, that's as good. That's <laughs> a natural wonder. I'll take it. It's actually kind of—it kind of depends if I was gonna find one or not, whether it's worth it. But yeah, and then so like so, always first scout, always. The exception being island plates if you can see a bunch of water around you. And then second, you want a slinger. 
The reason being, it's kind of almost as good as a scout for scouting nearby. Uh, number two, you do need some troops to kill barbs, otherwise you're just screwing yourself over. Like, if you don't build defense, enough defense to kill the barbs, then whatever you build is going to be pillaged. Whether that's a holy site, or improvements, whatever. It's just going to be, um... Someone made mining. It's just going to be destroyed by barbs, or whatever. So you, you do need some defense, and the slinger counts almost as like another scout again. It can like help you, even if the slinger is just scouts nearby, you want to know where you want to put your first city or whatever. So get a slinger. And oh, by the way, also gets you, you can get a, you get very fast, you can get archery, an archery boost that way. And if you get it very early, you know, you can, you can, you can have your slinger and your warrior just walk over to a barb camp and very easily um, get yourself that bonus. Which is really nice because archers are you know you're gonna need this tech. You need that tech if you're going to any serious sort of warfare um, in the early game. Whether that's invading barbarians or a uh, player. And then so scout slinger. And then scout slinger settler. Now, I'm not doing that this game, but this game is very weird and different. And I will explain that. Do I want to build here? Holy sec. I think I'm going to greet out a builder. YOLO. Virtually always, you want a fast... What are you, what are you doing? A fast... I wish. I'm an idiot. I'm not following my own advice. Yeah, I'm still not going to follow my... Uh, this is different. Uh, you want that fast settler. Je suis Catherine, reine I hate de you. <laughs> the reason being, it's just very strong. Like, it's always good to just grab that extra land as fast as you can. And the big reason to do it super early is it's hard to get early. Like, the alternative, right, is to wait till you have an early empire to build to expand. But the problem is, it's hard to get early empire without mm, mm, without first getting a hard building a settler. For example, we're just stagnant at like puff three right now. There's no way with this plane start we without like getting a builder or two we get to puff six anytime soon. But that said, <coughs> me. I could do this. I think it's worth it. Like it doubles my growth speed. Right, like I, I know I lose two production, but it's kind of okay. You really want fast growth unless you're housing capped. Here, the dark Hello. brown amorphous basalt. So we would uh, so that um, that hut ended up being useless, <laughs> just because we found it before we were building a holy set anyway. That tends to happen. Huts often are quite useless. It's kind of too bad. Ironically, it's kind of better to find them late. Because you tend to find like boosts that are that are for things other than that are things that like you don't already have. If that makes sense, I said that weirdly. Like, let's say you skip masonry because you don't ever have a quarry in your empire. If you find the a random science boost la later, and it's more likely to be uh, for masonry because you haven't researched it yet. If that makes sense, and you can also get things like traders and builders. But, uh, anyway, I mean, it's still, still very important to scout early. Let's see, what are you, encampments? Eh, encampments kind of suck in single player, at least. What are you up to? You can just wait. But yeah, so, I'm just going to say this one more time. I should, I'm kind of just going off to, what the hell are you doing? Uh, oh, surprise war, I see. Yeah, they like to do this. Oh, this is what happens when you uh, let them find your capital, guys. It throws a bit of a wrench in our... Uh, I have no idea where you are. But basically, I need to get my slinger back here as soon as possible. Or my warrior. I'm just going to buy a slinger. 
what uh, what my plan was. But anyway, I, it's not. I'm not doing this game, so I'm gonna stop talking about it. But uh, the general plan is uh, the build order is. I'm sorry. Scout, Slinger, Settler. Holy sight. If you are going to build a religion. And then you buy a builder. You don't spend any gold until you have 200. And then you buy a builder. Scout, Slinger, Settler. Holy sight. If you're going to do that. Only do that if you're a religious sieve. Uh, only do that if you're if you want to, first of all. And if you already have astrology boosted and finished, or if you hard tech astrology, make sure you have it, um, and you're like a religious civ and you need a religion to like do shit. Yeah. Anyway, that's it for this episode. I will see you next time.